Good morning, everyone. Welcome. What an exciting couple of weeks this is going to be, right? Ah. Um, I just wanted to greet you very quickly. I have a couple of announcements for both our First Communion families and our Confirmation families um, before Father Scott um, talks with the presentation. Um, first of all, for our First Communion families, I know some of you um, look at your emails all the time. Some of you don't use email very often. This week, you will probably be getting, you will, you will be getting at least a couple of emails from me that are very important for you to read. Please pay attention to your emails from me or from Janet Bryant, our administrative assistant, this week. Um, one of those emails will include the streaming for any of your family members who are not in the state, um, who want to um, watch our First Communion as it happens, um, or watch, we will be recording it. Um, they, will, they will have an opportunity. You'll have, I will send it out after First Communion, the recording of it as well. Um, but you'll be getting that link this week from me. Um, you'll also be getting reminders, which will also include that required rehearsal that is this Saturday at 10 a.m. You will be signing in for that rehearsal. We need to make sure we know everybody that's here. It will really help you and your child to be at rehearsal, okay? Please be signed in and in your pew by 10. We really try to have that be one hour. 
Um, it's really important for everything that's going on in the, um, in the parish this weekend, as well as you and your family to know your timeline, especially if you're hosting family in town. Um, so please, if you could please be on time for that, that helps everybody. We really appreciate that. Um, if you have not yet had your child try a small sip of wine, um, you have received an email from me about that. You really don't want their first time, their first interaction with that taste at their first communion. And we have been practicing with them um, so that they hold a chalice full of water. They don't drink from it, but they're, they're taking it from the Eucharistic minister, and they're very careful with it, and they're handing it back. So don't have worries about that, okay? We really are working with them and talking with them about that process. However, I have had families come up to me, and as a parent who has two children who went through second grade, first communion, everyone is grateful for that little tidbit of information to have them try wine at home for the first time before they come, because it is very different flavor than they're used to. And the kids know that that information has gone to you, okay? All they have to do is just wet their lip a little bit, okay? It's not a drink, but we want them to be focusing on the grace of receiving Jesus in that moment. We receive Jesus in that moment. And that's the focus for them. So please, Please try that at home if you haven't yet. Um, if you have any questions about that, please talk to me after. Um, does anybody have any last minute, last week questions about First Communion? And if you have a question, probably somebody else does too, so don't hesitate to ask. Ooh, even our parents are ready. It's very exciting. Good job. Okay, for confirmation, there. As you were signing in, we have those two blank spaces. If they're blank next to your name, one under the number of attendees that will be in your pew with you, including your confirmation student, and the video release form. If that is blank, we need that number and we need that form by today. And we have extra forms up there. Um, for confirmation, the required rehearsal for Confirmandi and their sponsor, and at least one parent, is on Wednesday, April 24th at 7 p.m. And just like our First Communion parents, please be on time. We try and make it as short as possible. Um, it will be at least an hour, if not a little more than an hour. We have 20 Confirmandi this year. It's very exciting. It's a beautiful class. I'm so excited. It includes my daughter, um, but please be on time to be signed in and seated by seven, okay? Um, does any, and if you have, if your child has a proxy, I haven't heard of any proxies for confirmation. If your child has a proxy, which is somebody to stand in for their sponsor, um, so please let me know after because we need that person's name and all that good stuff. Okay, perfect. Um, are there any last 10-day questions for confirmation? No? Okay. All right. Well, thank you all for being here. It's been quite a year. Um, I know it's very exciting for your kids, too. I am keeping all of you and your kids in my prayers. Please keep us in your prayers as well as we, as we um, get all the details together for these beautiful ce celebrations. We really want our kids to feel the grace and the joy of receiving these sacraments. And I know that it can be very demanding on parents and families with families coming in town and the details and what are they going to wear and all of those things. So please, as I try to with my own daughter, practice the pause, breathe in the Holy Spirit, 
And if on that day of confirmation or First Communion there are challenges within the family and lots of different things going in different directions, pray for the grace of the Holy Spirit to bring peace to your family so that you can feel the joy and grace within your family and be sharing in that with your children. Thank you. And with that, Father Scott. I'm sure he's going to start in prayer. <laughs> I have to laugh when, when my wife says something like that, it's, it's yes, ma'am. <laughs> so I'm, I'm accustomed to that with Kelly. <laughs> Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Well, Lord, we ask your blessing to come upon us now as we reflect upon the great gift of the Eucharist to our lives and how the Eucharist truly is the source and summit of all that we are as human beings and as the body of Christ. Grant this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So sometimes people ask me, um, so what kind of wine should, should the kids uh, take, right? And I recommend a 94 cab. If that... <laughs> okay, anyway, um, if, if you'd like... Um, we, can, we can provide you with a little bit of the actual wine that they'll be receiving. It's a mild rosé, um, but, you know, for, for those of us who drink wine, what's mild to us is like, whoa, what in the world is that for our children? So uh, you can actually, um, you know, after Mass or sometime, you can actually come back with the kids and we could have them try the rosé that we have right here, or you could bring, you know, a little bottle and uh, one of these little tiny jars and, and take it home so they actually taste exactly what it is that they'll be receiving. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, I still think a 94 cab would be good. That way you get, you get to drink the rest of the bottle. Yeah. Okay, um, one of the things I, I wanted to, uh, to comment about um, before getting into the, uh, the substantive presentation about the Eucharist is um, the importance to us of supporting you as parents. And uh, for years and years and years, um, I mean, f literally from, from the time that I was uh, formed in priesthood, um, the statement is drilled into us, parents are the primary catechists of our children. And that's absolutely true. We all know that to be true. But what was always a disconnect for me was that we say that, but then in the life of the parish, there's not much going on to actually support the parents, right? Because Lord knows we need support. And for those of you who aren't uh, here at, at C's, uh, I've got three kids and seven grandkids, and, and so I've been in the battle, right? I, I've been through the journey that's involved. And it's not easy, and, and I actually, as the years have gone by in my priesthood, have, have said to myself, what kind of support would I have wanted, right? What would I have benefited from? Because you're saying, well, wait, Father Scott, you're a priest. You should know all that stuff. Yeah, baloney, right? I mean, it's a challenge, and it's as much of a challenge for me and my wife as it is for you to know how do we nurture our children? How, how does that work? And so, um, what was it about four years ago, five years ago, we began these parent sessions. Um, and they're really important to us in terms of supporting you. But what we would appreciate is uh, feedback, and the best feedback you could give would be to Kate Bazine or to Kelly. Um, or Teresa, and, um, and to give really good constructive feedback because we're constantly thinking ab about how can we improve our support of parents. And this parent uh, meeting is one of the places that we provide that support, but uh, you know, there are also countless different ways that we're providing you resources and uh, for those of you that have not been involved in the faith journeys uh, meetings, the parent meetings, you know, those are really important. And we don't, you know, we don't say for any of these, you absolutely have to be here or your kids can't be in faith formation. And we'd never do that, right? But 
but these are these are really important meetings, and 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 so we want the time that you invest in these meetings to be the best possible time where you're really getting support. And to me, this is a journey because this isn't something that we can draw from highly developed models. We, in fact, I don't know of other parishes that are doing this anywhere. It's probably happening in some other places, but Kate Bazin actually went to the uh, National Catholic Education Association uh, National Conference, and she was asked to be a presenter because they learned what we're doing here in the parish, and to be a presenter at the NCEA is a big deal. You know, it's really saying, we like what we see that you're doing. But our recognition is that, that there's a long way to go for us to do this as well as, as we would want to do it, right? And, but we need your feedback for that. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay, because I, I think sometimes, you know, you're, you're sort of, well, I'm just a parent, who am I? Well, you're, you're incredibly important to us. That's why we're doing this, right? I mean, and one reason I think that parishes don't do this is it's a lot of work to be involved in, in doing this kind of ministry. But to me, it's essential for, for who we are um, as, a, as a parish community for us all to support. One of the things that is happening with the Faith Journeys parents, so for, for those of y'all that aren't aware, haven't participated in that, that's basically parents with children in faith formation whose, whose kids are not in sacramental prep. So that's what, that's, uh, 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 is it, do, do y'all, are y'all involved in, in sacramental parents meetings for two years for each sacrament? Or just one year? Just the, just the last year. Okay. So for all the other years, right, that your kids are in faith formation, uh, Faith Journeys is uh, also a meeting that is really important for everybody to be at. And um, Kate has gotten incredibly positive uh, feedback from those Faith Journey parents meetings. And uh, some of the things that we're thinking about is uh, changing this meeting uh, from what's more of a uh, I don't know, lecture, I don't like to call this a lecture, but uh, you know, a, a, where we're sh a presentation format um, to one that's a little more interactive. But this is, uh, this is all part of the development and the more feedback that we get from all of you, the better that we'll be able to meet your needs. Make sense to everybody? Okay, good. Um, so <laughs> this, uh, this presentation is about the importance of the Eucharist. And, you know, one of the things that, that I know about uh, uh, anybody that's, that's even semi-active in the life of the Catholic Church is that you know that the Eucharist is the center of our lives as Catholics. You know that intellectually, but, but the, really the bigger question is, do we really know in a deeper level, both intellectually but also in, in a, a heartfelt relationship with Christ and his church level as to why the church teaches that the Eucharist is the source and summit of our Christian lives. If we don't understand why and really get it, then even if we're there in the pews at Mass, we're not participating as fully as Christ wants us to participate in the celebration of the Eucharist. And, and so, um, you know, we, Deacon Kurt and I, we, we uh, uh, preach about the importance of the Eucharist regularly at Mass, but this is a, this is a time where um, it's, it's an occasion, I mean, I, I've had courses on the Eucharist, that's how important the Eucharist is, right? So in 40 minutes or 45 minutes right now, um, you know, how much can I cover? Well, I hope I can cover enough to where you get the heart of, of why the church teaches what it teaches. So um, 
in, uh, uh, in our scriptures, we have the institution of the Eucharist in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I'm not going to go over that, but what, th what that reflects is exactly uh, what we do when we celebrate the Eucharist at the altar, right? And, you know, Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, right? I mean, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we have what is clearly the institution of the sacrament of the Eucharist. In John, it's a, a surprising that that institution, what we call the institution narrative, doesn't exist. And so one would say, why in the world is that, as important as that is? Because it's clear that in the early church, the church was celebrating the Eucharist. And, um, um, and you know, we have uh, documentation of that that's definitive. And so why did he not include it? Well, there are a lot of different reasons, but one of the answers is that he does in fact include it, but John being deeper in terms of, 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 of theological reflection and uh, deeper is not the right word, but, but John has this ability to use symbolism and um, and, and, and a deeper sense of literary impact on having a deeper understanding of various theological mysteries in our lives, one of which is the Eucharist. And so we go to John 6, and that's where we find the primary uh, reflection in the Gospel of John on the Eucharist. And what do we find there? Well, Jesus <clears throat> has fed the 5,000, and now... Um, he, uh, he has what we call the bread of heaven narrative. And he gathers together um, with, uh, uh, with the disciples, and there was a crowd that was present. And, and he said, um, uh, Very truly I tell you, you're looking for me not because you saw signs, in other words, those were the things like miracles, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. And, and here he was referring to the uh, feeding of the 5,000, right? He did this miracle. And then he goes on, do not work for food that perishes. So he's looking to the sign of the feeding of the 5,000, and he's saying, well, you know, that was a great gift to you to be able to be fed with food, but that's food that perishes, right? And he goes on, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. And um, he, he goes on, our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Do you all remember the manna in the wilderness? I've, I've talked about it in homilies, but basically when the... Um, uh, when the Jews uh, were freed from slavery in Egypt, they went into the desert for 40 years. And one of the things that Jesus did to teach them to depend upon him, to trust in God, was uh, to, he didn't provide them food that would last for a week or a month or something like that, that they could put aside. What he did was he gave them manna that that they found on the ground every day, and it would spoil in one day. So they had to rely upon God for their food day to day to day, right? And that's the manna that God provided. And it was a, 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 a real sort of flaky kind of bread substance that they, that they would eat. And um, in... Uh, uh, in the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, which was in the Holy of Holies of the Temple of Jerusalem. That's the one that, uh, um, what was the name of the series? Um, oh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. You know, they're, they're seeking the Ark of the Covenant. You know, that's a takeoff on, on what's a really deeply serious biblical uh, historical matter. And that is that in the Ark of the Covenant were the Ten Commandments, the broken uh, tablets of the Ten Commandments, and there was manna that was present there. And this was a very important part of, of Jewish uh, life. So, um, 
So Jesus goes on and he says, very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And so the crowd says to him, sir, give us this bread always. Makes sense, right? That's what I'd say if I was there. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. So, um, so then the Jews who were there, that's the crowd, began to complain about him, about Jesus, and said, and because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They, they were saying, is not this Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Now, of course, what does it mean for Jesus to have come down from heaven? He's God, right? I mean, Jesus is saying, I'm God. If you were a faithful Jew and you were looking at Jesus there, you'd go, no, you're calling yourself God. There's only one God. How can you be saying this? Follow what's going on here, right? I mean, it's a, it's a serious matter that's happening, and they're complaining. And, and so um, how can he now say, I have come down from heaven? And Jesus answered them, do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father. And then he doubles down. He says, very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. <laughs> I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now, if we stop right there, um, Protestants who, for the most part, in sort of 99% of the cases, believe that the Eucharist is just simply, they call it the Lord's Supper, and that the Eucharist is just symbolic. It's nothing more than that. And they would interpret this passage, and I think that you could make a case at this point that if you didn't understand that they were actually celebrating the Eucharist in the early church and believing what is said here that, that Jesus is saying, that it would be easy for you to go, oh, well, he's just referring to that we're to believe in him, and by believing in him, Jesus is the bread that came down from heaven, and therefore we're going to receive eternal life. But then, but the problem is he was talking about flesh. And so the Jews disputed among themselves and said, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Can you see the shift here? Right? I mean, they're talking about eating his flesh. How can he give us that to eat? And so Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, and he doesn't say, oh, no, 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 don't worry about it. This is, I'm not saying that you're really eating me. This is just symbolic, and so settle down. It's okay. It's only symbolic, right? Now, understand, they're getting all upset about this. And if you put yourself in the place of a faithful Jew, it's understandable that they were upset. But Jesus doesn't back off. So Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And here now it's crystal clear he's referring to the Eucharist, right? As we understand it as Catholics, this is full-blown Eucharistic theology. <clears throat> Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood, have eternal life, and I will raise them on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. 
Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I, I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like that which your ancestors ate and died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. And he was actually uh, teaching these things in a synagogue in Capernaum. And Capernaum was the center of Jesus' ministry. That's where, um, where he called the fishermen as the first apostles. They lived in Capernaum. It's a seaside town, the biggest town on the Sea of Galilee. So that was the center of his teaching. So he's actually teaching in a synagogue. So I think that, you know, when it comes to teaching our children, um, you know, second grade is, uh, it's interesting, uh, we speak of it as the age of reason, and uh, any parent knows that if you call a second grader a reasonable being, uh, you know, it's not exactly being real. But I think that, that, I think there is truth to the fact that a child can get, if we properly catechize them, and that's most importantly by you, a child can get that this is God, that this is not just food, but it's actually Jesus that we're, we're receiving sacramentally in, uh, in our lives here. And a lot of this has to do with uh, the very uh, way that we as parents come to, um, to live in our relationship with the Eucharist. So if we walk up to the Eucharist and it's just sort of like this that we receive it and it's like, okay, thanks, amen, and we walk across, you know, that that's going to say to our children by the way that we're receiving the Eucharist that, well, you know, this is just something that we do. And, and in a sense, that type of reception of the Eucharist is, um, is, is, you could say, where we think it's symbolic. That, okay, well, this is a symbol and it's sort of a spiritual moment and I'll, uh, okay, I've, I've gotten the bread and now I'm going to consume it and this is a spiritual act and it will strengthen me, right? That's, that's Protestant theology, right? When we come forward to receive Christ, I, I always uh, remember there was a man, um, I, I can't remember his last name, but he was a colonel. And, um, and he was the head of the native hospital when it was at the old location. Those of y'all that have been around for years, um, this was uh, uh, closer to downtown and uh, near where, sort of a little bit down the street from where Brother Francis Shelter is. And, um, and he was the first person that when he would come up to receive the Eucharist, uh, he, he, was, he looked like Colonel Sanders. Um, and he had this distinguished looking face and he was much, he was really quite old when I first got to know him and he would walk down you know, sort of a little bit unsteady on his feet, and he would come up to receive the Eucharist, and every time he received it, he would say, my Lord and my God, and he would receive. And I remember how much that moved my heart. You know, Thomas' confession, um, you know, one of the most profound confessions, maybe the most profound in all of the scriptures, my Lord and my God. You know, and, and, you know, the church teaches that we say amen. I'll never look at you funny if you say my Lord and my God, right? But when we say amen, that's really what our heart should be saying. My Lord and my God, right? I'm going to be receiving the actual flesh of Jesus Christ that will nourish my soul. And likewise, the blood, right? It's not just symbolic wine, Protestants use grape juice uh, a lot of times. Um, it's really the blood of Christ in sacramental form, but it's really the blood of Christ. And, and if we receive Christ in that way and our children see us receive Christ in that way, 
that teaches more than any words can ever teach because they're observing us, <laughs> which uh, that's kind of scary, isn't it? When you think about the way we act sometimes and that how we're acting is what we're teaching them. Um, uh, you know, sometimes I look at it and I go, oh man, I just acted that way in front of my kids and that was not the homily I wanted them to hear, right? But, but every single time we come to Mass, what is the reverence with which we come to receive the Eucharist? Okay, so um, any questions about that? Because there's a next really important uh, step that I want to talk about the Eucharist. This is pretty 101 Catholicism, right? For us to understand this. Okay, so <clears throat> this is actually more important than what I've just said. Because what I want to share with you now is why, theologically, do we believe that this is the body and blood of Christ? Now, one can look at the institution narratives and say, well, Jesus said, this is my body and this is my blood, and that's what we're supposed to believe. As Catholics, that's true, right? But there's a much deeper, more profound theological uh, uh, reality of what's happening in the Eucharist. And it's actually a reality that is built into all of our liturgical language as we celebrate the Eucharist, and, and it underlies everything. And you'll hear, you'll hear me refer to it frequently in my preaching. And that is this, that, that Jesus in his death on Calvary died once and for all. Now, what do I mean by that? It's a singular historical event, right? Make sense to everybody? It doesn't happen over and over and over again. So for the Jews in their sacrifices, they were sacrifices, and you made one sacrifice after another after another over the course of the year and over the course of years, right? The scriptures... In Jesus' teaching, say to us that there was one sacrifice that happened once in history, will never happen again, that brought salvation to all people in all time, in times past, in times forward. And that singular sacrifice of the Lamb of God for the sins of the world um, will never be repeated historically. Everybody with me there? Right? However, that historical event that happened once in time is eternal. So there's a historical in time dimension, once and for all, but that sacrifice is eternal in its consequences and in its meaning. That's why it stretches out to the past and to the future, right? Why it stretches out over all the universe in terms of its salvific character. And so we have this, uh, this one-time event which is eternal in its character as well. So it's both historical and it's eternal. And because it's eternal... It's a sacrifice that stretches out into all of time. And what the church teaches is that at the Last Supper, Jesus made this special dispensation in instituting a sacrament where this once and for all sacrifice that is eternal will be represented on the altar. And this is the language that the church uses that the eternal sacrifice, once and for all on Calvary, is represented on the altar, and it's why we call this an altar, that it's represented like, like we are going back to Mount Calvary and are present for the very sacrifice of Jesus for the sins of the world. I was talking with the dean of uh, the Mount Angel Seminary when I was going through my formation there, um, it was, I was in an independent study instead of a resident. And 
And he made a comment, which at first it sounded a little bit hokey to me, but then the more I thought about it, the more I thought, wow, that's actually a good way to think about this. He said, it's like if we had the opportunity to go one place in time travel, one place in all of history, where would we want to go? And he said, you know, it's like the Star Trek, if you, you take that, what do they call it? The, what, what's the name of that machine that sends you somewhere else? Transporter, yes, yeah, the transporter. All right, so the transporter becomes a transporter in place, but also a time machine in time, right? Where would we want to go? Well, I could make a strong case that where we would want to go would to be at the foot of the cross with Mary and John and the other Mary, because there the salvation of the world was won for us once and for all. How that would impact our lives, right? And, and for us to actually be privileged to experience that, as, as terrible as it would be. But we can't all crowd around the cross. But God, in his wisdom and mercy, can bring the cross, can bring Calvary to us. And we can come and actually participate in the representation sacramentally of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for the sins of the world that happened once for all in history. So this is why we call this an altar and not, like Protestants do, a communion table, right? They reject the language of altar because they don't believe that this is actually a sacrifice that's happening. Everybody follow what I'm saying? right? It's why I'm a priest and not just an ordained minister. It's why a priest is the only one who can consecrate the Eucharist because I am offering a sacrifice that is the representation of Jesus' sacrifice on Calvary 2,000 years ago. So, and then you will, when you listen to the language of, of our prayers, you know, things like, pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice, in other words, I'm standing in the person of Christ, in persona Christi, offering the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for the sins of the world that is represented on the altar for all of us to experience. It's represented sacramentally. And then my sacrifice in yours, you are bringing the sacrifice of your life to be united with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for the sins of the world. So what we're celebrating is not a repetition of a sacrifice over and over and over again. What we're celebrating is that we are entering into the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ for the sins of the world that is represented for us. Why is that possible? Because it is an eternal sacrifice. It's not just historical. And, you know, I can talk about this intellectually right now, right? But what I'd, what I'd really, you know, Im, Im, just implore all of you is if you've never really heard this or, you know, you may have heard me say it, but it didn't really sink in, you know, allow this in your prayer life to sink in because it will completely transform the way that you come to celebrate the Eucharist. If you really get this and you really believe it, it's like, how could I possibly not be at Mass and just be doing other stuff on Sundays or Saturday evening? How could I possibly not say, I want to be there, right? Because this is the place that Jesus has given to us as gift to come to be present and to unite ourselves by the sacrifice of our lives with his sacrifice, which is present for us every time we celebrate the Eucharist. I mean, it's, it's so profound that you know, I have to say, everybody, and this may sound odd, you know, I, I celebrate 
Mass most weekends at least four times, and sometimes I'll have a wedding and a funeral that happen, you know, so it can be six times on a weekend that I have a Mass. And I have to say that because I hope I get this, that I've never celebrated the Eucharist and felt like it was just me going through the, the steps. Every single time, it's like, I can't believe God has called me to be a priest and that I am so intimately involved in this representation of the eternal sacrifice. I mean, it's, a, it's just this sense of utter unworthiness, right? Of, of being in a place to do that. So it, it's never anything but profound for me. It's never something that just becomes, I'm going through the motions, right? In fact, if anything, it becomes so profound that it sometimes, I don't understand why I don't make more mistakes because I'm so present to what's happening that, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really not consciously thinking about what comes next. Does that make sense to everybody? You know, I mean, it's just kind of like I'm entering into it in such a profound way, but it's this sense of, the, of this privilege of, of being in this place and, and, and the, 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 the humble sense of, my goodness, how can, I, how can I possibly be called to do this? Well, what I'm called to do as an as a, a ordained priest it's your privilege as well in, because you're part of the priesthood of all believers, right? I mean, you are part of this sacrifice, right? And that's where I love the... It was a change in the most recent uh, uh, translation of the Latin to where it restored the sense of me saying of my sacrifice and yours, right? You are in your role through your baptism as the priesthood of believers, you are coming to also participate in this. I always love, uh, with my Protestant brothers and sisters, like to say that, um, you know, where they, they have an altar call at the end of Mass, I always like to say we have the ultimate altar call, which is the altar call to celebrate the Eucharist and, and to come forward to receive the body and blood of Christ. Let's see, time-wise, okay, we have, uh, we have like nine more minutes. A any questions or reflections that y'all might have? Is, uh, yes, uh-huh. What do you say to those individuals that are more averse to drinking from the exact same cup as everybody else? Okay, so those who are more who are averse from receiving from the same cup is that you don't have to receive the blood of Christ, right? So if if that's a health concern for anybody, it's not required that you receive. So whether you receive the body or the blood, it's the full presence of Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. And so there are many uh, historically uh, the uh, uh, the body of Christ was all that was served during Holy Communion. It was back in the 1960s at the Second Vatican Council that there was a restoration of receiving the blood of Christ. So, um, so it, if you only receive the body of Christ, you're receiving the fullness. But receiving the blood of Christ is, is, uh, is also you know, part of the fullness of what it means for us to participate, but it's not required in any way. Okay. Yeah. So, so I, actually, one thing I, I can share uh, that would, might be helpful for somebody that has that kind of concern is that they did a study of, uh, of the communication of disease through the cup and from serving Holy Communion. And the result of the study was actually that there's a greater chance of something being communicated through the body of Christ than there is through the blood of Christ. And in, 
uh, partly because the blood is, is uh, alcohol that's self-cleansing. Um, so they, they concluded, and this was prior to COVID that this study went out, um, that there's a self-cleansing effect of, um, of the, uh, uh, the blood. I, and I would also say, you know, I receive uh, four, four and four, eight, eight to ten times a week from the cup, and I don't get sick any more than anybody else. So I, that's anecdotal, but that's, you know, that's my own experience, yeah. So other questions? That was a good question. If you're not receiving from the cup, should you still be referencing the cup as you pass by? I think it's a good thing to do, is as you pass by that you just make a slight bow to the cup and continue. Yeah, I, you know, I... I'm always careful because if people don't do that, I don't want somebody to think, oh, I'm being critical of you for not doing it, right? I mean, that's, um, but I think it's, if you're passing by Christ present in, in his blood, that a slight bow is a good thing to do, yeah, if you're not receiving. Uh, I'll give you, give you all an example. Um, uh, the, uh, the Oron's position of a priest is like, this is what's called the Oron's position of praying, and there's, uh, there's, there's some teaching that says parishioners should not hold their hands out like this because that's unique to a priest in the, the priest praying. Um, you know, it's like, okay, that's, that's true, but if anybody holds their hands up like this, the last thing on earth I'm doing is looking at them and going, oh, you shouldn't be doing that. You know what I'm saying? You know, to me that's kind of crazy. I, I don't know. Uh, if you all know the, uh, the young man who's up here who was in a, a car accident, uh, he, he, actually a car ran into him on a bike. He was one of the premier athletes of Alaska, and Derek now has you know, trouble walking well, and he always has his hands up like this, right? And I'm not going to go to him and say, don't hold your hands up like this, because for him, that's like a way he's praying, you know? Um, but... If somebody was to say to me, Father Scott, technically, should I be holding my hands up when I'm praying? My answer would be, yeah, not really, you know. But on the other hand, when you hold hands during the Our Father, that to me is not the Oron's position. That's, we're choosing to hold hands with our brothers and sisters. That to me is an act of, of just common prayer. The only thing I say to folks is, don't, don't force your hand upon somebody next to you because there's some people that don't want to hold hands. And, and I think we should always respect that. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. But, you know, when I'm in the pews with my family, which happens maybe once a year at most, uh, we're, we always hold hands during the Our Father. I mean, that to me is, it, it just feels right. Been involved. Okay, any other questions? John Hamm? Okay, well, let me just, you know, again, emphasize to everybody, you know, the parish is here to serve you, and, and I'm thrilled that you all choose to be here and to take your parental responsibilities seriously to come and to be part of this. But the more that you can give us feedback, the, the more we're going to be able to actually meet your needs, because... You know, I can be here talking like this and, uh, you know, sharing, uh, sharing my heart out over things that I feel really passionate about. Um, but uh, what's really important is for you to be able to share with us how it's impacting you and what a difference it's making for you. And the more, that, more feedback we get, the better we can change things whenever, wherever it seems like we can improve it. Make sense to everybody? Good. Well, I'm so excited about it. I mean... Uh, uh, the, for those of you that are having your kids confirmed, I'm really excited about that. But you know, I have to admit, like most people, it's like kids receiving their first Holy Communion. There's something special about that, that you know, that, that's so so wonderful. So I'm, but I'm looking forward to uh, to both of these wonderful occasions. Good. Well, would y'all please rise and let's close in prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, we give thanks for our children and for the wonderful gift that they are to our lives, and we pray that you might help each of us to be able to 
uh, to be able to um, help them to come to know Christ, to know his love for them, and to enter more deeply into the wonderful gifts of, of the various sacraments that they're receiving and truly be able to, to believe in and experience his presence during those sacred liturgies. Grant this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay. Don't worry about that right now. Okay. If you don't mind, just come and come up and we'll practice some singing. All right. We're going to start from the very beginning. Genesis. Yep. Four twenty. It's just back there. I don't know how can you have it. Most of the time you stand in the back. No, that's not true. And Heidi can attest to that. Well, I know I'd like to stand here, but I'd like men to be standing next to one another. I know that, but I mean, I'm usually right here. Aren't I usually up here? Yeah, I haven't lately. Lately, but in, yeah. the, in, the, in the past, most of the time. I don't want to discuss that. Well, I mean, let's... If Scott shows up, I'm happy for you to move down, but... Okay, the discussion is over with. 427. <laughs> um, I just want to do the first one, two, three, four. If you want to join in, you can. Okay. 